Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum with Tom Kennedy and Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? It's new, Tom. It's finally a cold day in Dallas. You can see behind me, it's cloudy. It's no longer 75, 80 degrees. It's, it's 55, and it's cool. Uh, it feels a little bit like a winter in Texas. Yeah, it does. Uh, year of the leap year. We got an extra day this month. Can't wait. How are you going to spend your leap day? Uh, crossing my fingers, hoping this market continues to, uh, to, to rally here. Um, let's, ju- let's jump into it and talk about uh, a topic that comes up a lot, and it's stock purchase plans through, through corporations and startups. Um, so we'll touch on that. We'll do our central bank roundup and answer uh, a few questions that we've gotten over the last couple months. But let's start with... Uh, Stock purchase plans. Yeah, so we have, I know I do, I'm sure you do as well, Tom, a a number of clients who work at corporations that are publicly traded. And with that, they often have an option to either receive as part of their compensation uh, some stock, either outright, or have an opportunity to participate in a employer stock purchase program. And there are a lot of varieties, so anything we talk about today is not specific to one, but we're going to talk about some of the things we see most commonly. And the first one I will start with was just, just, non-qualified stock-based compensation. (laughs) Try and say that three times fast. But basically what it is, is, you know, we're going to attach some golden handcuffs to you and say, you know, you earned a $20,000 bonus. Congratulations. Um, Today, we're granting it to you. A year from now, it's going to invest, and it's going to invest one third of the time over the next three years. And then you're going to get $20,000 worth of shares in your account. Uh, That's kind of the most common thing we see. And the thing to know about that is that stock is going to be taxed as ordinary income when you receive it. And that day that it invests is going to be your day that your cost basis starts. And from there, you can either have a capital loss or a capital gain. Yeah, so let's let, let's break those down because we get a lot of questions on that because they can be kind of confusing. That's that's one iteration of, of many, which we'll talk about. But let's go to the non-qualified. So you have... Well, let me ask you, you have these different these different dates. You have the grant date, you have an exercise date, and then you have a sell date. What's what's the difference between the three? Yeah, so Tom, you've done a great job here in the past year, so I'm going to give you some stock in our company. Congratulations. Uh, I'm going to give you a grant at the end of this month. We're going to say March 1st. You now own, own, and keyword in quotes there, uh, rights to 100 shares of our company stock. Uh, or to make it simpler, uh, 99 shares. A year from now, you're going to get 33 shares vest to you. Uh, two years from now, you get another 33. And a third year, you're going to get another 33. Meanwhile, you might do another great job next year, Tom, and I'm going to give you 99 more shares. And the year after that, I'm going to give you an additional 99 shares. Each time I do that, that's a grant of shares. Each time that that year passes and you actually receive that stock, that is your vesting date. And that's when you receive it. Um, and that's the day your cost basis starts. So, okay, we have the the grant date and that basically starts the vesting schedule and they could be three years. I've seen some that are, that that are longer than, than three years, but then you have an exercise or a strike price on on that stock. So how does that work? So that that kind of depends is you're going to receive those shares uh, and be granted at whatever the stock price is today. So let's say it's a hundred dollars, but that stock's going to move up, down or sideways over the next year. So when you receive it, you might receive it and the stock's trading $85. Or you might receive it and it's trading at $150. So your exercise price might be different than the money that you actually receive because you're getting the shares. So you're getting a unit count, not necessarily a dollar amount. When they grant it to you, it's in lieu of dollars. So instead of $20,000, we're going to give you 99 shares and we're going to invest it over the next three years. So it can be advantageous because then when you receive that, hey, now the stock's gone higher, thing, things are looking up for me. Uh, it also has a lot of risk. So one of the things we talk about a lot is uh, diversification. So if you work for an employer and you get all of your income from there, your benefits are there, and you're also owning a bunch of company stock either through this program or another one, you got a lot tied to that one company. 
the most famous one, which actually comes out of Houston, is Enron, where a ton of people actually participated even further and invested their 401k and other retirement savings into Enron stock. And they all went from millionaires to zero uh, overnight when it all came out that it was a fraud. So one thing to be thoughtful about is if you are receiving these, is what to do with them. Do you keep them? Do you sell them? Uh, my rule of thumb for folks uh, is usually 5% of your overall net worth should not be tied into company stock. Now, if you're a high executive and you're getting a ton of shares, that can be kind of unavoidable, especially if you're one of these insiders that doesn't have the ability to share because you're not allowed to sell. Um, you know, that, that makes things a little bit trickier and you have to find ways to, to uh, be thoughtful about that. But ultimately, you're just taking a lot of risk. <laughs> you're kind of stuck with it. So, yes, and it's a question we get all the time. You know, you're getting granted all these stocks. Now you're fully vested or fully invested in most of them, when do you sell? Because there's different tax treatments for that. Do you hold on, do you let it ride, or do you start slowly selling out in tranches? What's your what's your thoughts there? Yeah, well, I think what you see with uh, some of the leaders of these companies, so like a Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, uh, once you get to their level, they have to have what's called plan sales, and they have to file that with the SEC uh, and say, I plan to sell all this stock over the next couple of years. I'm going to do it on a regular basis. I think that's the best way to do it, even if it's just you know a smaller set of shares, shares because you go over the next year, I want to get rid of this. You're going to sell some days that are good, some days that are bad. Um, the second would be to work with an advisor like you and say, Tom, what do you think of this stock? How do you like it on valuation? What do you think its prospects are going forward? What are the price targets from some of the wirehouses for how high the stock could go? Do most analysts have it buy rated? Do they have it sell rated? What's kind of the view on the, the street? What's the consensus opinion? And you can use that to determine do I buy or sell? And then one thing I alluded to before is if this starts to make up a big part of your overall net worth, you just got to start selling it. And it's not to say put it in cash, just be more diversified uh, as far as your investment portfolio goes. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. And you know these are these are tools that are used uh, to your point for retention for for client for clients staying within the companies within the organization. And we see it a lot, especially in the oil and gas sector. Um, we have a lot of clients that come in and they never sell and they have a significant amount of their overall you know, retirement nest egg invested in their company stock because they're believers in their company. They, you know, they like the space. They know the space. Going back to our previous podcast about just kind of having that backyard bias, they they know their industry. They, they know their company. But to your point, I think it the prudent move is is, is to sell and, and to diversify. Um, you know, you don't have that's a the key choice word. on that's how the key word, is That's the prudent that. move. You don't have to do it. You can let it ride. You can let it grow. You can take all the risk you want, but know going in, this might blow up on you. So as long as you're aware and yeah. you understand the risk you're taking, I'm okay. You want to put it all in? Go crazy. But let's be thoughtful about it. That's not what a CFP would recommend. That's not what I'm recommending. We want the prudent solution. Um, but if you just go, no, my company is the greatest. And look, there's a lot of people who made a ton of money in tech by going, ah, I think Google's going higher. I think you know Apple's going higher. And I work here and I know. And they might not be right, right? We talked about all our biases in a previous episode. Uh, they're probably subject to all of those, but you know, know what risk you're taking is the key. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, th there's another stock option that that's pretty common outside of those where you do have a choice uh, if you want to participate, and that's the em employee stock purchase plans. And typically, how those work is your employer allows you to buy their company stock at a discounted price. Um, you know, back when I started, I worked for a, a, a company and they offered this program and how they did it. And they're all set up different ways, but they said, we're going to give you a quarterly window. And throughout that quarter, the lowest price of that stock, we're going to give you a 15% discount to purchase X amount of shares of that stock. And again, that is optional. I, you know, I always say, if you're going to be able to get a company stock at a 15% discount and they're going to look at it over the last three months at its lowest price and base it off of that. Um, you know, that's, I don't want to say free money because you can buy that. It can go down 15% the next day, but I think it's a good opportunity to help diversify, help buy into a stock at a much, much lower price. And to your point, it kind of goes along those same lines. You don't want to overdo it, but I think it makes sense if you have one of those purchase plan programs to take advantage. Yeah. Of. I, I like that. You use a key term here, which is margin of safety. Um, and there's two other ways I've seen people have employee stock purchase programs. The other one is if you buy three shares, we're going to give one for free. 
And so that's kind of a 25% buffer as opposed to the 15 you talked about. So if you work it, you know, I can't say one specifically because we're not allowed to, but there's one that's in the Dow index that their program is, uh, you buy three shares, we'll give you one for free. And if you keep doing that and you have this 25% just kind of free piece of it, uh, I think that's a pretty good margin of safety. Obviously, you got to be thoughtful about the risk. You can work with an advisor and see valuation. You can look up, you know, what the uh, street consensus is. Uh, the other thing I've seen is a deferral program where you can put cash aside and companies will bonus uh, on top of that. So I'm aware of one where they give a 10% bonus on top of that and it buys the shares once a month. And then you have the option. You can keep those shares and let them grow and reinvest the dividends, or you can sell them and take the cash immediately. So each employer plan is going to be a little bit different and you got to kind of go deep. And you know, if you need a visor, we, <laughs> we might know if you can help you with this type of thing. But these are all great plans in which companies are putting out their money to try to help employees buy shares to feel like owners or to give them golden handcuffs. So they're great programs. Make sure that you are thoughtful about the risk you're taking. Yeah. And, you know, unlike 401ks, 401ks are pretty straightforward for the most part on what you can and can't do. There's some iterations with other companies, but stock purchase plans, whether it's the non-qualify, the uh, participation plans, uh, RSA, RSUs, there's so many different variations and so many different ways they work. And I mean, nine times out of 10, if not 10 out of 10, most employees have no idea how these purchase plans work or how their stock options work. So I highly recommend, you might, uh, might not even know it's available to you. I highly recommend getting with an advisor to go over your benefits package. I mean, everything from healthcare to 401k to uh, your stock options, because over time they can make a they can make an impactful difference, especially if you're you're getting in on a quarterly basis, dollar cost averaging things we always talk about. So I would definitely, um, if you have a stock purchase plan, get with someone who who knows how it works and what the best option is for you. Yeah, and you know the the 301 class or the really advanced class. If you hear the word, you know ISO. As far as options go, you hear about special appreciation rights or SARS. <laughs> you hear about phantom stock. You hear about all these other advanced corporate things that are available to you, especially if you're an executive. Uh, call somebody who knows what they're doing because these are complicated and each company has the rules a bit a little different. If you have an executive retirement account, uh, all those type of things. These are things that your company wants to give you to try to make you happier there, to give you nice benefits, to keep you there. Um, but make sure that you know how they work and are using them to the best of the ability. And more importantly, if you if you are using them already, um, everything is about net net. So they're all taxed differently. You don't want to make a big <laughs> mistake by selling it too early or, 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 or not knowing exactly the ins and outs of how they're taxed because that does make a big difference. So Agreed. good point. All right. Um, should we see what's going on in the uh, world of central banks? Shine those boots. It's time for... <laughs> Okay. Central Bank Roundup. So um, we got a big number coming out uh, tomorrow, the PCE, which the Fed has continued to say that they are they don't care about CPI, they care about PCE. And that, that number follows the trend that it did uh, a couple weeks ago, um, and it's hot. We could see uh, we could see a little sell-off in this market. Yeah, I think there's a couple thoughts on the Fed, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on beyond our borders. But the came into the year, and I think we talked about it probably on a previous podcast. The expectations were several rate hikes, up to maybe five or six this year. So a pretty big cut, you know, one to one and a half percent. Um, and now the market and the Fed funds futures, I know you like to look at those. They're pricing in two or three cuts for the rest of the year. So a pretty big change from where we were just two months ago at the beginning of the year. Yeah, you know, coming off of uh, coming off of the October lows, um, you know, the reason why one of the reasons why we had this rally was because the dovish sentiment and to your point, the bond market pricing in, you know, five, six cuts by the end of this year. And that's that's changed after we saw that hotter than expected in inflation print uh, was the last week or the week before. I can't remember. But yeah, it's it, it, it shifts and it, it it's. It's pricing in. I mean, now to your point, two, three cuts, and that could quite that could go back down to six if, if we see uh, some better data next week. So it'll be interesting to see what the what the Fed's stance is on it if they're going to stay higher for longer. But I think the market has kind of grown callous to it. I think the more important numbers, and I mentioned this before, are going to be the growth numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole idea behind having this hard landing, soft landing, or no landing is if 
if growth continues to outpace the inflation. If inflation is falling, but growth is falling faster, which we haven't seen just yet, but if growth starts to weaken, um, I think that's what could, could get us into in, into some trouble in the overall market. But so far, we have this Goldilocks scenario where inflation is continuing to decline. Uh, growth is, is staying steady. We just went through earnings season. Um, <clears throat> earnings got revised down to about two, 243 a share um, from 245, 250. But the market's kind of priced to perfection right here. So I don't know. I don't know what other tailwinds we have. Yeah. So um, what I was going to say is I think you're, you're right. And I, I think one thing to remember as investors is the most important thing is earnings per share growth. And that happens over time. These fluctuations that we see in markets and causing all the volatility is shifts in the P.E. value. And that is driven by what you're talking about is cuts or, or raises and, um, you know, interest rates. The price of money has a big impact on the price of stocks in the short term. In the long term, it is earnings growth. And so we need the companies to report positive earnings and so forth. Um, to shift abroad for a second, and this is going exactly what you're talking about, which is the Bank of Australia, or sorry, the Reserve Bank of Australia, as well as the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, they had meetings in the past week, and they let out some information that was interesting. And Australia said, higher for longer, we're just going to keep that. And, uh, you know, hey, in six months, our next move might actually be a cut higher, not lower. And more importantly, the Bank of New Zealand said, we're going to hike rates. <laughs> We're going to hike them probably two more times over the next six months, and we might keep going after that. we got to wait and see. And so obviously these economies are very different than the other ones. Uh, it's not something that is just you know simple and straightforward. You can say what happens in New Zealand is going to happen in the United States because they're wildly different economies. They have different you know, demographics, different industries, all that. But I think it's important because I'm a big believer in coordinated central bank action. And whether it's you know, Jerome Powell on the phone with somebody over there, or if it's just watching each other and kind of saying, well, what are they going to do? We're going to move based on what we think they're going to do. Uh, the signal to me is they got to defend their currency by raising rates. That makes the most sense if the next move for the Federal Reserve is to actually raise rates another quarter point or 50 points instead of cutting rates. So this is trying to read tea leaves, and it might be something that I'm reading that's not there. Um, and other countries might have challenges that we're not going to face. But you know, there still is a lot of asymmet asymmetry in bonds where, you know, I think they're not going to raise five more percent. But I think it'd be a big shock for the rest of the market if they go up 25 or 50 basis points as their next moves, as opposed to cutting. Yeah, you know, you know, the Fed's been pretty independent of the other central banks, I will say. I mean, they were they they acted first and they went up real quick and the, and the rest rest followed. So I, I don't. I mean, man, if, if they raise rates to the, the Fed, then all bets are off or it's going to be ugly. But I think they stay they stay higher for longer. I think I think we will see a couple cuts this year. Um, but the economy has weathered it. I, I, I've been shocked looking at earnings and how these companies have dealt with higher rates. You know, maybe five percent isn't as high. Maybe we, we just zero was obviously way too low. But I don't. They've weathered the storm pretty well, and I don't think they're going to go higher from here. If anything, they're going to, they're going to cut, and that should hopefully be be a tailwind to, to, to the overall market. Yeah, and if they don't, just be prepared, but, right? So, <laughs> but you'll you'll see but, inflation you know, yeah. have to tick up before they would hike again. I think so. We'd have to see some bad numbers. And yeah, it could, it could happen. I don't know what other measures they, they, they would have if inflation starts to tick up. If they raise rates again, I mean, we had they had nine hundred billion. As a, as a line item expense last year, just an interest carry alone. I mean, you can only continue to raise and even keep rates this high for so long. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll bankrupt themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's almost German, mathematically The German impossible. bank, the Bundesbank, they actually lost money last year for the first time, uh, and it's not going well. And I think there's only so much political will to let them continue to lose money on these kind of moves before they say, eh, enough, we're, we're taking over, you know, <laughs> determining interest rates, so. And obviously, we know about the United States. If interest rates continue to rise here, the whole budget of the country will be paying interest. So, yeah, you know the the, the part of the the part of the market that's that's been kind of getting hit as of late is the is, is the mortgage market. I mean, you just saw rates jump up again. I think they're over seven percent. Um, so I don't know what that's going to do with 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 home prices. Home prices have been pretty steady. They haven't dropped in a lot of the, the major cities. So it'll be interesting to see. What happens with that? But I, I just don't see an environment where the Fed can keep rates this high. They just can't based on the balance sheet alone. So I think they'll have to they'll have to cut 
rates, unless, to your point, inflation just takes off the other way, which um, who knows? I think the number the numbers tomorrow will be pretty pretty telling on, on what we see. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned we might have some questions from the mailbag. Uh, what do you have for us? It's time to hear from listeners as we open the mailbag and answer your questions. The 800-pound gorilla in the room right now, which is shockingly, you know, we're getting a few questions here and there, but crypto, oh. cryptocurrencies. I mean, you got Bitcoin up up to almost record record highs again. You know, we're at 62,000 right now on, on Bitcoin and, and the cryptocurrencies. Um, we've talked about it before. It is, a, is an extremely volatile asset class. I feel like we had to mention it just because of the run that we've seen in the last month alone. Um, it's it's absolutely skyrocketed. And I don't know if, how long it stays up there, if this is a meaningful, a meaningful trend and if it's going to continue or if we're going to just see all those gains get given back uh, sooner or later. You are going through the having uh, event right now in in Bitcoin and in crypto, but I can um, see that Michael Lewis that's all on saying. shelf right back there. I, I I know that you've been reading it, haven't you? You're getting excited. I, when are you moving to your that, Caribbean well, island, that, starting your uh, exchange? That 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 book was phenomenal, by the way. I like anything that Michael Lewis does. He he had a lot of controversy in that book, saying he got too close to uh, to his subject. We won't mention his name, who's currently awaiting sentence. A life sentence in prison, um, sure. but it's it, it, it is is interesting that that type of risk asset has been rallying uh, and and quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, spirits are off. People are uh, back to speculating. Um, well, just just kind of close on this then, as far as mailbag questions. Um, I actually, I don't know if it will be published or not, but I had to write an article for a publication this week, and uh, it was asking about cash, and it was kind of making the point. Hey, anybody who puts too much money in a high yield savings account last year, they missed out on 20 plus percent gains in the stock market. And um, I have my comments, which will be published hopefully soon. But before I share mine, what are your thoughts on, you know, we'll call it people waiting in cash or spending too much in cash. How do you feel about cash, Tom? Well, I think what, what people didn't know and, and, and are going to get caught off guard probably right now as we speak, as they start doing their tax returns, is that money market accounts, you know, again, assuming it's in a taxable account, non-qualified account, not in, not in an IRA, that's not applicable. It's taxed at ordinary income. So, yeah, you're getting five, five and a half percent. But if you're in the highest tax bracket, that's three. Um, so... And yeah, it's a great parking place and, and five and a half percent looks great until it doesn't, until you have 20, 25. I mean, we're off 20, I think 26% off the October lows um, since last year. So you've had a really, really, really big rally. I think cash has a piece in the portfolio for sure. Um, some people just need the safety. It, it's not a bad place to park money, especially at those high interest rates because five, five and a half, it still isn't, it's, it's not terrible. It's much better than when we were, but there's, there's other areas where you can get that type of income like bonds, you know, bonds have done so poorly over the last three years and it's a hundred percent driven by that rapid, rapid rise in interest rates. I always say it's not rising rates is not bad for the economy or even bad for bonds. It's the velocity and that we've never seen anything like that. It's not going to happen again. May, even if they do raise rates one more time, we were we're not going from zero to five and a half. Or we're not going to go from five and a half to ten, um, or else we're just all in really, really big trouble. So, if anything, if rates come back down, that should have a positive impact on 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 bonds. So, I think, you know, going back to traditional, let's look at bonds. There's there's tax free bonds. There's corporate bonds. There's high yield bonds. Um, I think there's better places to to park cash right now than money markets not saying you shouldn't be in any of it but there there's seven trillion dollars sitting in money market funds that's going to have to come back into the market eventually and you're probably starting to see it now because there's a lot of fomo people missed out big time last year and uh it was no one's fault we didn't know what to expect with these higher rates and everyone's banging the table about having a recession last year that never happened and may never happen um, yeah, well, to, so that's yeah, my key. I think that it. there's a, a key kind of differentiator or nuance to that, which is you're talking about cash as part of your investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you're dead on that you shouldn't have too much cash in your investment portfolio. You should almost have you know little to no cash in your investment portfolio because there are opportunities for higher gains. And one thing I think to separate from that is we don't know what percentage that money market, we'll call it $7 trillion, 
is people's just emergency funds. And as planners, you know, the rule of thumb is if you're a married couple, dual income, three months uh, in emergency fund is a great idea to, you know, wade through any trouble. And if you're single, uh, six months, or if you're in a single income household, you know, having six months in emergency fund is essential. Um, you know, and you can do it one of two ways. You can look at the income and just multiply it. It makes it really simple. Or you can say, what are my expenses? And you can also say, well, what would my deductible on a new roof? And I get in a car accident. I got to replace the air conditioning. It would well, say all these things happen in the same month. Do you have enough cash to wait through that? So I think that there's something to having enough cash on the sidelines in case things go wrong. Um, I don't know what you found with clients for whatever reason. And this spans a pretty wide spectrum as far as net worths. Hundred thousand dollars seems to be the number. A lot of people just keep in cash, either in, you know, checking, savings, or money market. Uh, that's the you know we'll call it the mode. The most common one I see is I, they just feel like a hundred just feels like enough. Um, and I see that with clients that have you know very significant net worth to you know kind of lower end uh, net worth that they want to have enough money to weather a storm to feel safe and that number for whatever it's probably an American thing of you know we just like to have the hundred, <laughs> and so they like to have that. Piece. Yeah, no, I. I uh, you're 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 right. I think three to six months is is a good good rule of thumb. And and by the way, if you're listening, saying well, what the heck, I'm not getting five and a half percent in cash in my Chase account or Wells Fargo account. Those are money market funds, typically found inside of a brokerage account or some sort of an investment platform. Most savings accounts, high yield savings accounts, are only paying two three percent. Um, and you got to go to the non brick and mortar type banks, the online banks that are paying a little bit higher, but most banks still are not paying that much. Most I see are under 2%. And if you have the big four, um, it's forget it, you're, it's you're closer to nothing. Yeah, yeah, nothing. Yeah. So, um, but I agree with you. You should have something in checking savings for a rainy day, three to six months, uh, fixed costs saved up. Um, and then yeah, I was talking more about for no, no, that's an asset that class because it's important it, because you might it, the thing people get in trouble with that we see and the reason that uh, you know one of the reasons our business exists is that it's hard to hold on during a crash or in this situation during a rally um, and not participate in the emotional you know roller coaster that goes along with it and so cash in an investment portfolio you have to be very careful and very much minimize and if you can't handle it and cash makes you feel a little better that's great um, it's going to hurt your performance long term because it's typically a drag and. For 15 years prior to the raising rates, it was zero. Uh, now you can get four or five percent because you can buy treasury bills that are three months and keep rolling those. And right now you're paying a little over five. So there are ways to have your cash work for you. Um, but I think it is important as planners to say emergency fund essential, whatever number you need to keep feeling safe for your day to day life, that's keep that in cash. Uh, but in your investment portfolio, yeah. cash is a problem. So try not to make it a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah, because you got to look at real return, which is basically your inflation minus the return of that money market fund that you're in and plus taxes. So it, well, let's say you're in an IRA and if inflation's at three, three and a half, four percent and you're only getting five, well, your real rate of return is one percent. And if you're in a taxable account, you're actually losing money after you pay taxes on that. So it, it, you got to look at the whole picture. Um the five, five and a half percent you're seeing on the money market is only half of it. The other half is, well, where's inflation at? And then what are my taxes going to be on that? And then you can do the math and realize, and maybe this isn't the greatest place place to be, but um, it's a balancing act. I agree. Yeah. So if you have questions for your specific situation, give us a call. Um, otherwise, thanks, Tom. And can't wait for two more weeks from now when we do it again. All right, Kevin. Thanks. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.